The title of my sermon this morning is It's Not Too Late. Uh, we're going to talk about the issue of offense. Um, I don't, I, I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot of sermons that I walk into and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk about this issue. It's a little too deep. Like, I like to be a little bit more laid back, chill, fun, like, like, lighthearted. Those are a lot easier to deal with. For me personally, too, because right, they tell you to put about 30, one hour for every minute that you preach is the amount of time and preparation that you should put into a sermon or a speech. So if I talk for 35 minutes, they tell me I should put 35 hours into that sermon. Does that make sense? Um, so you, well, whatever you get for 35 minutes, I probably got for 35 hours. Maybe not that much, but total between, it takes a couple weeks to kind of develop into these. So there's some really deep stuff we're gonna talk about. We're gonna try to look at a story that's a little odd story. It's in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. And I'm gonna read it, we'll talk a lot, and then we'll talk, chat back over the story. And then at the end, we're gonna just spend some time with Jesus. And worship. And here's what it says. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came out, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. It's a bad day. All right, we all say our kids are demon-possessed sometimes. They're not. This is a real thing. Jesus did not answer a word. He was so nice. His disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the child's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Only Jesus can get away with calling someone a woman. You know what I mean? Like, we will get killed. Woman! We're, we're getting that, we're, you know, like, uh uh. We get a knife thrown at me from a father's day. <laughs> he said this. He said, Your request is granted. I may rethink the whole knife situation now that I just said that. Oh, maybe I'll buy myself a vacuum, you know? <laughs> Her daughter was healed at that moment. Sorry, sometimes things just come up. There are only two people in all the Gospels that Jesus commended for their faith. None of them were the disciples. But this woman was one of them that he commended for her faith. It was one of them. That's a big deal. But this morning, I want to ask this question. This is a question that God has been asking me. He said this. What, what do you do when people offend you? What do you do when people offend you? We've all been offended. And we've all reacted in really bad and unhealthy ways, so just deal with it. Like, we're all guilty, right? We're all guilty. Um, one of the things that is interesting, you know, he, uh, he said he commended this person's faith. And we're going to read later, we're going to look at how the disciples just botched this whole thing. I think sometimes we put people on pedestals where there shouldn't be a pedestal. Right? Growing up in the church, I was like, Paul was so awesome. Peter, oh, he was so cool. It's like, Really? That dude got mad, was cussing out girls, denying that he ever knew Jesus, cutting up people's ears, like getting called Satan, like, you know what I mean? Like, these people, they're just real people. And I think sometimes we should put Jesus on, not sometimes, we need to realize that we put Jesus on a pedestal, and that's it. Like, Jesus gets a pedestal, nobody else gets a pedestal. Nobody else gets a pedestal. Nobody should. No modern day pastor, no person in the Bible, Moses, Noah, no. Jesus gets a pedestal. Everybody else is equal. So what do you do when people offend you? Here's a bunch of just natural things that we do that just happen. It's just the way it is. We run away. You just say, I'm out. So your boss gets mad at you, you go, I'm done. Right? Relationship, I'm out. Uh, you have five jobs in five years. You're on your ninth marriage. Right? You're just like, I'm out. I'm out. You just, you like, you just check out. You say, I'm done. Uh, maybe you stay, but you emotionally check out. Right? You say you're fine, but you're not. You're like, yeah, I'm here, but you don't really care anymore. doesn't matter what. You can even just check out like physically, but not be physically checked out in your job. You know what I mean? Like you put the least amount of effort possible and not get fired. You're checked out. You're checked out. You, what about revenge? There's a revenge that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, Old Testament. 
You know, like that was put in place because the revenge was getting so bad that Jesus was like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Y'all got to limit this. This is getting crazy. The only thing, only thing that you can do is whatever they did to you, you can do exactly back what was back on you. That was it. He was just trying to limit it because the revenge was getting so bad on one another. Maybe you like social media. Right, well, don't do it in the nitty gritty. Right, maybe you're the type of person, can't believe they did this. You know what Joan did? You just type it all. It's awesome. Passive aggressive post on social media. Screenshot after screenshot. Did you see what so and so posted? Screenshot, send it to 14 other people. Maybe, that, maybe that's you. Maybe you bottle it up and say, you just keep it inside. Keep going and keep going and keep pushing it down, keep pushing it down, keep pushing it down, keep pushing it down, pushing it down. You push it down so much it just gets replayed in your head over and over and over and over again for years. Uh, you know the Bible, right? the Bible says, uh, Paul talks about it. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger, but it also says, and your wrath. And, and looking at this, I didn't know this before studying this. Wrath actually has two different meanings. One, it means wreath. The idea behind the wreath, have you ever looked at a wreath? It's all twined in a circle, right? It's all twisted. What it's really meaning is that if you don't let go of that anger, it's just going to twist up your insides. It's like, oh, that, that stung, right? It's like, oh, it's like you wonder why so many people, our insides are just so, ah, it's the wreath. There's this wrath that's inside that just keeps being twisted and twisted and twisted. And the other one is for gobs. The other word is for gobs. You know what I mean? It's, and it's trying to tell us if we don't let it go, no matter what we do, we can run from here, run from that. It's going to follow us if we don't deal with it. Oh, the hush of person, right? Like that's, that's why. That's why you can let somebody say something to you when you were 14 years old, some loser dumped you, and it's still messing with you when you're 54. Why? Because you. That wrath is still there. That offense is still there. We're still hanging on to it. Maybe you you like to play the Christian card, but you do it in a roundabout way. You really want to ruin somebody else's life. You just put God next to it. Here's how we do this. We, we say things like this. Let me tell you, God sent me here to protect you. Let me tell you about this. I think the Holy Spirit just sent me to you to speak prophetically into your life about Johnny. You know what I mean? Like whatever it is, right? Gossip and slander can sound really nice when we put like godly words right before it. It's still just as wicked. We're just using God as an excuse to gossip. So there's a lot of different ways that we do it. There's a lot of different things that can be done. And here's the honest truth. We can respond any way we want. You really can. Get on social media, blast away, do your thing, push it down, get angry, blow up, do whatever thing, run away. Just don't call yourself a Christian. <laughs> Anybody can do anything you want. But there are certain ways that Christians should respond. Because we're living in the age of offense where everybody's offended. Men are offended. Young people are offended. Older people are offended. Women are offended. Democrats, offended. Republicans, offended. Everybody's offended. And we're all just yelling at each other. And then we watch turn on the TV and everyone's still yelling at each other. And it's kind of like Christians have been sucking into this more than anybody else. We really have. Christians have been sucking this as much as anybody else is, if not more. We're so mad sometimes as a society that we lose focus on the Great Commission. Our job is to reach the lost for Jesus. That's it. And we're so mad at everything else that's going on there. We're like, we haven't shared the gospel with anybody in like 32 years. But we're not mad about that. We're just mad at about this and this and this and 14 other things that are taking place. We've lost focus because of all the offenses that are taking place. Offenses are not anything new. It's the one thing Jesus, one of the things that Jesus himself promised was going to happen. Matthew 24, 10 says, many will be offended. And then Luke 17 says, it's impossible that no offenses will come. So the God that does the impossible promises and guarantees and says it's impossible that offenses will not come. It's a big deal. Uh, when describing life, God used the term and used the phrase as a race over and over and over again. And so we have these hurdles behind us. 
See, my son Jack does hurdles, and I would never do hurdles. I was always afraid of like jacking my knee up, right? Like you hit the hurdle with your knee, you fall over, you embarrass yourself in front of people, and you're just like, no, oh, no, don't want to do that. So kudos for the people who do hurdles, because that junk is embarrassing if you fall, right? But they don't, it's actually amazing. Like I remember the first, their first track was like a month ago, whenever it was, right? Track season's like two months long, they've never done them before, they throw all the stuff at a bunch of seventh graders that they've never done all this stuff before, and she's like, poof. Go learn a new sport in two, three days. You had to stay, you know, do it in front of like a thousand people and all the other teams and everybody else. And they don't fall. It's amazing. They jump over and they teach what they're good at. But life isn't a sprint. Life is a marathon. But the offenses in our lives are our hurdles. They're our hurdles. And we have to figure out how to jump over them or kick them out of the way. Because life isn't done on a track. Life is done in the woods, <laughs> in the rain, and through creeks, and rivers, and potholes, and so many things. But the offenses that we have in life are hurdles. And you can almost call them hurtles. That joke. That's okay. <laughs> wow. I know. Sometimes my dad jokes work, and sometimes they don't. You just. Shame on you. I know. <laughs> I'll get better next week. Trust me, I can't wait for Father's Day. That's like a pull all out, right? The whole thing is just one long 45 minute dad joke. Awesome. My kids hate it, but I love it. I get them all out. But when you're running, when you're running, one of the things that they tell you, they don't look down, don't look down, don't look, don't put your head down. Keep your head up. Why? Because you're always trying to look at what's ahead. You're always trying to look at what's ahead. It's the main reason. The other reason is you keep your head up. Your lungs have a little bit more air in them. Posture is a little better and everything else. If you keep your head up, you look at what's ahead. And it's the same thing in real life. If the hurdles are our offenses, if all we do is every time we come up to something, here's my offense and here's my offense and here's my offense and here's my offense, and we just look at these issues, we'll never see what's ahead. We'll never accomplish the goals that God wants for our lives because we will stop thinking about the things that God wants for us, the things that we want for us, and all we are looking at is the hurt and the pain that is real. It's there, the offenses that have happened to us. It's the hurdles that are in life. It's the hurdles. Offenses will come as a promise. An offense is what has happened to us. An offended is our reaction to it. Right? An offense is what happens to us. That's guaranteed. Being offended is a choice. Right? Being offended is a choice. Offenses are our promise. Offended is a choice. Offenses is something that happened to us. It's going to happen. It's a promise. Offended is our decision. It's our choice. It's optional whether or not we get offended or not. No, nope, it's not. They did something to us. Yeah, they did. That's guaranteed. We now have a choice of how we are going to respond to those things. So what is your level of offendability today? Right, what is our level of offendability? Truth will offend us first, and then it will transform us. Right, our, the, the truth of God's word, if it doesn't offend you at some point, you're not really reading it. Right? You're reading bits and pieces of it that make us feel good. Well, read the Gospels. Jesus was taking people off left and right with what he said. He was, he was making people uncomfortable with the things that he was saying to us. Truth offends. And then when we embrace the truth, embrace God's grace, it'll transform our lives. But we have to let it transform us. We have to let it inside of us. So here's the tension in Matthew 15. You got the Jews and the Gentiles. These people do not mix. She was a Canaanite woman. She was not a Jew. They didn't like each other. It wasn't like a one-sided thing where one side didn't like the other side and the other side didn't know why. No, both sides were like, ew. All right, this is a conservative going to a Hillary rally. This is a liberal going to a mega rally, right? Like, these people do not mix. And it might happen again. I'm just warning you, right? It, it, it might get interesting. But Jesus will always take us out of our comfort zone. The disciples didn't want to go here with Jesus but they followed Jesus. They were following Jesus. To their credit, they were following Jesus because their commitment to him, they went where they didn't want to go. They probably would have never gone to these two cities ever in their life. We ain't going there. We ain't going in that neighborhood. No way. Uh-uh, we don't do those type of things. 
So I remember the first mission trip I went out was the LA Dream Center in downtown LA. Now it's completely different. This was in the mid 90s when this thing first started. Remember the, remember the movie Training Day? Denzel Washington, lots of swear words. <laughs> Don't let your kids watch it, lots of shooting, gore, all that kind of fun stuff. It's a good guy movie. Women probably wouldn't like it, but more on your shoulders or feet or something. <laughs> like, and I remember we went to this, we went to this cul-de-sac. So we went down to this LA Dream Center, it's inner city LA. They host, house the homeless and they get them jobs and they get them the training and all this stuff and get to pull them out of skid row and biblical training and all this different stuff that they do. And they're building relationships with different neighborhoods, doing things on Saturdays. And one of the neighborhoods was that cul-de-sac that they filmed the movie in. It was called Crenshaw Boulevard. It was a cul-de-sac where they trained the movie and they all got beat up. There's all the shooting scenes in it. And it's a cul-de-sac. And when we showed up, we went to that cul-de-sac. I was like, yeah, I'm not in my comfort zone. <laughs> you know what I mean? I grew up in a city of like 50, maybe 75,000 people. Like... That was not something I was like really used to. We were knocking on doors, helping people, pray for people. I remember walking back to the bus and they're like, hey, we gotta get going. It was like four or five o'clock and they go, the police shut down the road at this time. They go, the police don't come here after dark. So we gotta get out before like stuff gets hot. And we were walking back and there was three or four gangbangers sitting down and they were all rolling blunts with like pistols sitting next to them. I'm like, Hey guys, hey, what's up? I'm like, <laughs> different scene, right? Different, out of place. I'm like, 15 year old white boy, you know, 135 pounds, soaking wet, four hoodies on, you know what I mean? Just like, ah, what do I do? Luckily, I was with other people who knew what they were doing, right? You don't do that without that. But there was tension. This is a place they would have never gone, but God will always, always, always take us out of our comfort zones. And this woman would have had to run up to them in the middle of this discomfort. Because she would have felt this the same way the disciples felt it. There was no way she was interacting with them either. She was like, nah, I don't want any, any part of you. But there was something bigger that was messing with her life. Her baby girl was demon possessed. In trouble. And she was like, her, the bigger the issue was, help, it was helped her see the truth. It helped her see beyond her pain. And I think sometimes, our pain can stop us from being petty. Right? Sometimes our pain can stop us from being petty. Because you know what it's like to be put in mom and dad mode. Right? Parent mode kicks in and you're just like, it doesn't make a difference. What, what is going to happen? You're like, hey, I'm going to find myself in jail. Why? Because it just dad mode just kicked in. Right? I remember a couple, couple was it, I don't even, maybe it was last summer or summer before all of our boys were at the park. We live a couple blocks from the park and they're at the park and we go over and these high schoolers were talking trash. I was like, oh, heck no. <laughs> right? Like, dad mode kicks in, right? Like, he was probably fifth grade, going into sixth grade. You got a couple of elementary schools there. And they were legit, like, swearing at him, trying to, like, beast them. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> you all get off the court. Let me handle this. You know what I mean? Like, instant. Like, I didn't need warm up time to, like, the blood flow, the emotions, the riled up, I was like, oh, boys are going to get dropped. Like, instant. Right? Kids are like, let's just go home again. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but parent mode kicks in, and you'll do anything. She didn't care who she had to go to or what the situation was or how, how awkward it was. She was so desperate, she's like, I got Jesus and nothing else. This guy, if he, this guy says who he says he is, he's the only hope I got. He's the only hope I got. And she cries out, help, 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 help. And Jesus being all loving, all caring, just answers her immediately. No, he doesn't. This is where the first offense picks up. The first offense, <coughs> Jesus did not say a word in verse 23. Can you imagine that? This lady fights through all of her insecurities, all the past, all, all the stuff. And she cries out, help, 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 help. And he doesn't answer. Ignores her and starts scrolling through social media like, that's a funny reel. <laughs> Did you guys see that one? It just, it just ignores her. The offense of being ignored. It's the offense of being ignored. And sometimes rejected is better than being ignored. Rejection hurts. Don't get me wrong. Rejection hurts. 
at least you know. Right? At least you know at that point. We've all been there. Someone didn't take your email, someone didn't take your meeting, you get ticked off. My boss won't even meet with me. How dare he? Never get responses. Or we pray and pray and pray and pray, and God's like, and you're just, you're mad. When we feel ignored, we feel useless, we feel unimportant, and when that happens, we just push ourselves away from people. We don't try. We get ignored. And when God ignores us, we push ourselves away even more. But here's the interesting part. Jesus ignored, Jesus ignored her so much that the disciples answered. And they didn't answer in a good way. Right? The second part of the verse is that the disciples said, send her away. She keeps crying out to us. No, she was crying out to Jesus, not the disciples. We get that way, don't we, don't we? <laughs> right? We can get that way. Want to make it about you? Want to make it about me? Want to make it about us? No, we make it about Jesus. They thought they were special and they liked getting into her business. She wasn't even talking to them, but they put themselves into her business. She didn't put herself into them. She didn't talk to them. They talked to her. My job well, to do, is to do my best to try to push you to Jesus. My job is not to get you into a certain denomination. My job is to put you to Jesus so that he can get you to heaven. Right? I can't get you to heaven. I'm not special. There's no secret prayer. There's no secret formula to any of this. All right? There's like, uh, there's no prayer. There's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. That's a joke. Like, that's a church thing. It's a nice practical thing, but it's not an actual thing in the Bible. Repenting of your sins, that is. But the sinner's prayer, not. Nah. Confession, not. Nah. There's a lot of church things that are just not in the Bible. And the disciples, at least the way I'm interpreting the story, and if I'm leading into it a little bit, I might be. They were with Jesus for probably about two years at this point. They got kind of cocky. Right, they got a little kind of, they were with him for a while. They kind of felt themselves out. They weren't new to this whole church. And they're like, man, I've been here for a while. I know the routine. I got this. We can get that way. And I've been here for a while. I've done this thing. I'm good. At first, he becomes like, oh, man, so lucky. This place is great. And then after a little while, you just show up with sunglasses inside. Like, dude, I am so cool. A little different. She had to fight through culture. She had to fight through so much, and she got pushed away. Oh, dude, why don't you just get out of here, lady? You're bothering us. I almost need like a European accent. I can't do accents. Like I can't, so I'm not gonna try. But like, but it's just kind of like that snooty attitude. Like, oh, who is she? This Canaan woman. Get her out of here. Ugh. But something bigger made her continue to push through. Our pain can stop us from being petty. The little second thing is this, the offense of the system or the institution of the church. Church hurts a real thing. You know why? Because we see Jesus and we see the disciples next to Jesus and we think the disciples are going to act like Jesus. And they don't. They don't. Here's the sad part. I'll just be completely blunt. The sad truth in church world is most church plants, most like new churches that sprout up, are a result of a church split. People getting mad and angry at their current church and just go starting another one. Right? That's sad. I don't say I like that, but that is the honest truth. It sucks, dude. Because it doesn't just hurt the church, it hurts the gospel. It hurts people's lives and souls. And that stinks. But it's true. Because we have offenses. And then we don't act the right way. Because Christians don't do that all the time. So then we get mad. We act out in ways we shouldn't act out. We don't see the big picture. We just see this offense. We just can get even. I know I'm going to do my damn new story. Five pounds I went to the gym for the last four months. So I'm mad at my gym. I'm going to start another one. I'll show him. Right? Yeah, you went once a week and you ate McDonald's every day for lunch, but you're going to blame the gym. That's what we do in church world, just saying. But we have this institutional hurt. We have this thing. It's a real thing. It's a real thing, both inside the church and outside the church. My kid didn't learn anything. Well, did he do any homework? No, he goofed around in class the entire time. It is your fault. My kid isn't getting into AP classes. It is. 
See what I'm saying? Like, we can do this with everything. We can do this with everything. It's like, boss, is following my Gideon way. It might be, but is it? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Church, uh, we, we are seeing the moral decline in our country. We really are. We really are. But the church is to blame for it. And here's why. Post-COVID numbers tell us this. Your church, average American church, evangelical church, loses 30% of its people every single year. So every three years, your business organization has to grow by 100% just to break even. And it's for moving and all sorts of stuff, but that's a real thing. And then you combine it with about 20 years ago, they said when people, when they did studies, and people are like, are you a regular church attender? They go, yeah. That meant that they would go three out of every four weeks. Not, well, okay, it was like 2.9 to 3.3 was on average. Now it's like 1.2 for every four weeks. So once a week. Once for every four weeks. And so you combine these things and you see where the moral decline of our society is coming into play because people are making their spiritual health so much less of a priority. I'm real excited we have a mental health month, right? May is mental health month, which is great. But maybe there needs to be a spiritual health month. Right, because you have your emotional health, your mental health, your physical health, your relational health, and your spiritual health. And the spiritual health is really, really important to all those other aspects of our lives, and we don't place an emphasis on it. <clears throat> we have offenses of the system, the institution of the church. I'm so glad this lady, when the, the disciples said, get out of here, she didn't. She didn't. She came and knelt before him and said, I didn't tell him. Listen, Jesus doesn't owe me anything. I owe Jesus everything. Right? I owe Jesus everything. Jesus died on the cross for my sin because otherwise I was on my way to hell. He rose from the dead and without him, I'd have nothing. So he doesn't owe me anything. He's proven everything he has. He's all in. He's all in. My job is to simply kneel before him and say, God help. God help. And as I was doing this, got him right between the eyes and he goes, when was the last time you just simply knelt before me and just worshiped? Because I got a list. I don't know about you. Do you guys have prayer lists? I got a prayer lists. Like, right? I mean, we have prayer cards. And I tell you, when you have prayer cards, you just fill them up. You put in the bucket on your way out the door and I got a list. I'll just pray for them every single week. Awesome. I'm still going to do that. But what, what can happen to anybody is that we can get so caught up in our list of things that we want God to answer for it. Every time we go to God, it's about the list and not about him. And it's not about a relationship. She said, and what she did, when you kneel, when she knelt, she changed her posture and her attitude. She wasn't standing up face to face with them and saying, God, I need you to do something. She knelt before him and said, God, I need you to do something. Help me. Help me. Number three, the offense of insignificance. Jesus says, the, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. <laughs> you come to God and fight through all this stuff, and Jesus is like, yeah, I'm not here for you. Thanks, God. Oh, he's here for everybody. Don't you love me? What he was saying is this. He knew what he had to be here first. And what can happen here is this, is, Perspective is so important, and Jesus is trying to show her perspective. Perspective. It was just caused by him. And when we get offended, we see everything through that offense. It's impossible not to. That's what we see. We see everything through that offense. It's one. It, it's not the biggest. It's one of the biggest blinders that anybody can ever ever have. And that wrath will just continue to build up and build up and build up and build up. But humility is simply being open to another perspective. And Jesus was trying to show her. I said I came for the Jew and then the Gentile. He's like, I came for everybody, but there was an order that I came for. Why? Because he knew he had to clean up the house before more people could be invited in. The Jews were the people of Israel. They were supposed to be the chosen people, and they were messed up. And he was like, I can't bring more people into the family of the body of Christ until I clean out the house. The house has got to get cleaned out. And it wasn't saying that she was important. It was just saying there was other people that were more important in the moment. It's kind of like this. You ever been to the emergency room? I don't get there much. 
Honestly, not going to lie. Uh, we don't get that much, even with three boys. Well, I might get in trouble by saying it, you know what I mean? Right? It's like, hey, it hasn't snowed in a while. Next thing you know, 14 inches of snow happened, right? Crap, it's better than snow. <laughs> Anyways. About, what, seven, eight years ago, I was at a bachelor party. I kind of put the bachelor party together. It's the last time I've ever been in an emergency room. And I was shooting with some... I was just shooting with illegal guns, okay? They were illegal weapons. They were like a, they were like a mix between two different guns. They probably wasn't like legal shooting weapons. Anyways, it was made for right-handed people, right? It's like an AK-47 mixed with an AR, and like, you know, it's pretty cool. Anyways, I'm not right-handed, okay? I'm left-handed. So I don't shoot anything all day long. I let these 22-year-olds have the time of their life blowing stuff up left and right. I'm just doing right by God's law. And I'm like, dude, you just gotta shoot this thing. It's awesome. I'm like, all right. And so I go to, I'm, I'm left handed. So I go to left handed. The, the barrel on it, the little, like, whatever you call it, say, so I'm not a gun guy, goes back and hits me right in the mouth. Toosh. I'm in the wedding the next day, by the way. <laughs> like, hits me right in the mouth, cracks my tooth, like, shatters it, and just, oh. I get rushed to the ER. Nothing they can really do about it, the tooth, all right? Every long, big scheme of things, I'm fine, I'm bloody, I'm a little ticked off, but whatever. If I'm there in the ER with a real issue, and somebody comes in with a real gunshot wound, which one of that one is funny, is that they actually called Tina what happened, Gary got shot. <laughs> so, miscommunication a little bit, didn't get shot. But anyways, um, if someone came in with a real gunshot wound, and they just toss me an ice pack and say, see ya, we gotta deal with something else. I shouldn't take offense at that. That doesn't negate my problem, it just means dude, dude's got a real gunshot wound. My tooth is knocked out, gunshot wound. More important, gunshot wound. But we take offense to things that we have, other, we have issues, but other people may sometimes have other issues. We may not know what those other issues are. We just have to trust other people that they're dealing with them, and it's okay. But we have this offense of insignificance. We want to be the priority. We want to be important. We want to be needed. Right? Priorities. It should be this way. I'm not saying everybody's priorities are this way, or we're perfect 100% of the time. But my priority should be this way as a married guy with kids. Faith, marriage, kids, career. It's not saying my career's not boring because I'll be you know, paying bills and keeping the lights on is a big deal. Food on the table is a big deal. But I have to, if, if I'm going to do the things that God said to do and have his blessing on my life, if I want that, I don't necessarily have to have it. I think it's better to live life with God than without God. But if I want it, I have to do it his way. Period. So I have to put the priorities in the way that God has called us to make the priorities. And Jesus knew that he needed to clean up the super religious people and it was really bad before other people to be, to, could come into the situation. The truth is sometimes we just have to, we have this idea, this offense of being insignificant. So we want to know every little detail that goes on all the time. And sometimes we go chasing it. We don't need to chase him. We just have to trust Jesus. Is Jesus enough? Is Jesus simply enough? Humility is not saying you are not important. It's just saying Jesus is more important. This woman was determined. The fourth offense is this, is the offense of insult. Verse 26. Jesus said this. He says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Wait a minute. Can Jesus just call this lady a dog? Right? Like, that's some scary stuff, okay? I've said some really, really, really boneheaded things in my time, okay? I've never <laughs> called a close female of mine a dog, okay? That is not something you want to say under any stretch of the imagination. But Jesus was playing in the context. Jesus was playing in the culture. Tell you, God, the, the person who was on this planet says, call himself the God of the universe, call you a dog, you're getting picked. I don't care who you are. I'm like, excuse me? 
But here's what's interesting. In that culture, they would have called them wild dogs, a Canaanite woman. Wild dogs. Jesus didn't use the word for wild dog. He just, that's how it gets translated in English. He used the word for pet dog. There's a big difference between a poodle and a coyote. We shoot coyotes for fun. <laughs> okay, some people shoot coyotes for fun. Not everybody. Like, right? Some people go shoot coyotes for fun. They have to search for their own food. They don't have a steady home. They have to find a new home all the time. They have to fend for themselves. They have to get themselves out of the rain. Like, they're wild. They have no owner. They have no place. They roam. That's a coyote. A poodle? A poodle on the other hand? A pet dog? Man, there's people who treat their pets ten times better than their kids, y'all. Like, we all know those, maybe, right? But even, even at worst, you feed it, you're the one who feeds it, you're the one who brings it water, it doesn't have to get it itself. Heck, some of them have just automatic ones, so they just eat it by like it just comes down. They get food and water brought to you. Some of you moms are like, can I get food and water brought to me? They got a bed that's made for them and pillows and blankets, and it's like, wow, this is nice. You don't eat all the extra food that nobody else eats. You're like, hey, this isn't a bad gig. You don't have to do the dishes. Like, you don't have to clean up after yourself. Other people pick up your mess when you go to the bathroom. Like, you know, I mean, so by Jesus calling her a pet dog, it wasn't an insult. He was showing her that Yes, everybody else says that you don't have a master, but I'm going to be your master. I'm going to be your owner. I'm going to be your owner. He flipped it on its edge. I think that's why she stayed. Because let me tell you, that on the outside looks like an insult. You call me a dog? Excuse me? Uh-uh. That's an offensive thing. I am not talking to you. I'm sick of you being offended. Jesus was her master. And because Jesus was her owner, Jesus was the master. It didn't matter that the disciples were like, shoot, get away. She didn't care. She kept going after Jesus. And it wasn't until after all these offenses came and she fought through it and jumped over every single one that finally got to heal her daughter. God held her daughter. We have to stuck, stop being stuck in all these different offenses. Yes, our parents who have said stuff to us that botched things. Our friends have stabbed us in the back. Dreams haven't happened. Relationships have gone sideways. Business partners have stolen from us. And it all catches up to us. And we could probably sit up here and give you a million other offenses that have things that have taken place. Those are all true. But we have to keep our head up because there's something on the other side that needs to be bigger than what God is calling us to do. Or this is why people with relationships can legitimately be hanging on to what people said or did to you in high school, in middle school. And you're 53 years old and you're like, this still bothers me. Why? Because it's an offense that we have hung on to. We've never let it die down. Because it's something that was done. And it affects men, it affects women, it affects young, it affects all. It affects us all. But Jesus has to be our master. It doesn't negate the relationship to him. It doesn't negate the church or the past insults and security. But man, when Jesus is your master, he doesn't toss the hurdles aside. So get the heck out of here. Life is hard enough. Life is hard enough. Will you stop delaying your God-given destiny because you won't forgive? Our miracles, our destiny, our dreams are on the other side of our offenses. When she finally got through them all, that's when she got the miracle and Jesus healed her daughter. The only way is to jump over and push the hurdles out of the way by surrendering them to Jesus. The God is yours. It's yours. I'm just being honest. I'm trying to do my best to live a life that's not that it's carrying out all my hurts and my pain. Here's the question that God asked me, and so now I'm going to ask you the same thing. Do you want to be offended more, or do you want your miracle more? You can't have both. We can either hold on to our offenses, or we can have miracles.
which one do I want more? It's my choice. I have to choose it for me, and you have to choose it for you. I know it sucks, doesn't it? It's a lot easier if one person can make the whole choice for everybody. But it doesn't work that way. Because I have mine, and you have yours. And we have to wake up. So I'm not going to hang around to this anymore. We've all been done wrong in different ways. But what do you want more? Do you want to hang on to your offenses more or hang on to your miracles? I think sometimes our prayers are not going to be answered until we move past our pain and our hurts and our offenses. We've been carrying so much weight we were never meant to carry. There's so much more. And I think sometimes it's going to feel like we're forcing our actions or faking certain things, but you're choosing, and I have to choose to trust in the Master Jesus that when he says he'll take the pain and take the offenses, he really is. Because we can get so used to carrying around our offenses that we don't know life without it. Well, I've been holding this. This, thing, this, this girl said this to me when I was 15 years old. I've just been hanging on to it since then. I don't know what my life would be like without hanging on to this. And so we are okay because that's at least it's what we know. And we're okay with hanging on to our offenses because at least we know what we're hanging on to rather than stepping into the unknown. That's a scary place to be, but that's a place a lot of people are. We have to choose the type of person you want to be, the friends, the friends you want, the friends that you want to be, the type of coworker or boss you want to be, the type of marriage and relationships you want to have. You have to choose it. But the only way to do that is by letting go of the hurts and jumping over the hurdles and saying, God, take them. They're yours. We're able to. But we walk up to you and we're like, I can't do it. It's like, it's up to you and me. You can do this. It may be really slow. You may be able to do it fast. But you can walk up to it, step over it, sit on it, take a break, stand back up, walk to the next one. You can step over it. You can do it. You just have to try. We're going to hear worship soon. And when we do, I said, why we're doing that thing? Because I just want to spend some time with Jesus and say, God, it's just going to be about you. You know, what are Life Church's worship sessions for us? And we're just going to simply say, God, what offenses am I holding on to? What things am I holding on to? Because there's something ahead of my future that I want more. This lady wanted freedom for her daughter more than anything else, so she was willing to look past a lot of real offenses and a lot of real things that happened to her, just in this one little story. What are you looking at? What are you looking past? Are you looking ahead? Are we so concentrated on just this? That's all you see. You've got one, and you don't even know there's four more to come because we're so concentrated on just this one thing. That's all we can see. God's like, I'm going to take that off you. Yeah, but I've never lived without it. He's like, I know. What if there's another one? Probably. <laughs> He's like, you'll be free in the meantime. And I'll show it and I'll help you get through that one because offenses are promised and offenses are guaranteed. He's like, but I'm here to go come alongside with you. Finally letting go when all you've ever known is going to be really hard. But when Jesus, we have Jesus as our foundation at the Mass, so we know he'll be there for us to pick it up. But you just got to throw it aside. You can't do this. Not alone, but with him, you can. You can. And I don't know what your offenses are, and it may not even have been there in this list. It may have. But man, God doesn't want you to live with those offenses anymore. He doesn't want you to live with those offenses. So we're going to pray. And we're just going to spend some time in worship. It's just normal worship, so we have video worship. And we'll stand and we'll just do worship. It's 13 minutes, 15 minutes. It's a step. It may be this. I don't know how big of a step will happen. You may not feel like anything will happen, but I bet you it's this much. It's something. You may get a huge relief. I don't know. Telling you, God doesn't want you to carry these offenses anymore. That I do know. That, that I do know.
Let's pray real fast. Doug, you can play number two. Lord, I ask just right now that you'll begin to open up our hearts and transform us from the inside out. We all, we all have our insecurities, our fears, our doubts, our anger, our hurt, and more from the offenses and experiences that we have in our life. I ask you this morning that you begin to help us take the steps to letting go and trust in you. That at least in the next time, this time as we just spend time worshiping and thanking you for all that you have done, that we'll begin to see a change and a powerful change in our lives. That you'll do a powerful work in every single one of us and that we will leave here changed and closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship this morning.